Um, since nobody else thought of it, I, I wanted to go ahead and thank the organizers of this <laughs> conference. Um, but in all seriousness, true, I seriously do, but I, the people I really want to thank is all of you. One, for being here on Friday afternoon at 4.30, but also for the unbelievably uh, eye-opening, uh, invigorating uh, papers that I've been hearing for, for two and a half days. So, so many smart people. I'm absolutely intimidated by this. So, um, I, this, this opening slide, I, I thought I couldn't help but think yes, yesterday um, about the, the notion of comportment that, that Joshua was, was mentioning and the notion of appearance as, as performative um, in this slide. But, so that, that's the, the title slide. But the next slide actually was my original thought for, for the, the um, and this is, this is um, uh, Seneca protest against citizenship um, that actually I think was mentioned on the very opening um, talk on Wednesday with uh, the notion of Jolene uh, Ricard because it's her grandfather who's I think third from the left is that fourth from the left fourth from the or the right anyway in the middle um, anyway again perform right comportment as as performance because clearly they're dressed up uh, in a very special way to march in protest against citizenship uh, in, in 1926. Um, so my, my um, the, I think next slide. So my title comes from the, uh, uh, an early scene in, in, in uh, Chris Ayer's smoke, film Smoke Signals, which I'm assuming many of you are familiar with. Um, the two young men are leaving the reservation uh, to, to travel from Idaho, the Coeur d'Alene Reservation in Idaho to travel to Arizona. And Velma and um, Lucy, Thelma and Louise, but Velma and Lucy are in the car, a res car, and they offer Thomas and Victor, who are leaving the res, um, a ride. And they say, do you want a ride, and so on. And Velma says, you guys got your passports? Passport? Yeah, you're, you're leaving the res and going to a whole different country, cousin. But it's the United States. Damn right it is. That's as foreign as it gets. I hope you got your passports. Your, excuse me, your vac vaccinations. <laughs> um, so this humorous exchange early in the film suggests that even 74 years after the passage of the American Indian Citizenship, the Citizenship Act, the United States continues to be a foreign place for American Indian people, despite or possibly because of their status as citizens. Indeed, the 1924 CA Citizenship Act was necessarily, not necessarily welcomed by, by all, as we've been hearing for, for two and a half days. Um, Akuma writer Simon Ortiz has argued that, quote, and I think this is an, yeah, um, in every case where European culture has, um, European culture was cast upon Indian people of this nation, there was creative response and development. Today's writing, continues Ortiz, by Indian authors is a continuation of that uh, elemental impulse. And so what I want to do then is just talk a little bit about a few of those uh, writers and, and their responses. Um, so it's kind of, it's a, like a mini, a mini survey. Um, According to historian Jill Lepore, uh, quote, not all native peoples wanted citizenship. The Onondaga, the Onondaga protested the act as forced nationalization. Again, as we've heard, the Pueblo people had earlier asked to be excluded from the laws that granted citizenship, again, as we've heard, to men who had served in the First World War. Um, Mirabel of, Ta sorry, Porfiro Mirabel of Taos told a House committee, quote, all that I ask the government of the United States is that we want to be left alone and not made citizens. Okay, um, and so if we take the example then of the Onondaga, that, that, that first slide, that slide referred to, and I think this ne the next slide is, um, yeah, so part of that, and we heard this too, um, Audrey, right? 
mentioned, Sadra, sorry, mentioned this in, in her talk. Let's take the example of the Ondaga Nation in response to the 24 Citizenship Act, where a group of counseling chiefs signed a letter addressed to then President Calvin Coolidge, a letter w in which they articulated their opposition. Um, yeah, and so this this is the the opposition to the Snyder Bill. I don't I don't have to read through. You can see, and then um, if the next the next slide, um, an art inst an installation piece took that letter and put it on um, a well. Uh, um, um, you can tell by this by the slide there on a on a oversized wampum belt reproduction kind of or um, so let's take the that that example um, using this this letter in his artwork contemporary Mohawk artist Alan Nicholson created an installation piece called blanket refusal um, by silk screening the text of the letter onto a fleece representation of the two row wampum belt um, and then in next next slide just so you can get a sense so there's the actual text and then in the next slide again um and there there it is enlarged okay what's on there and if we and then you can go to the next to the next slide too okay so um michelle Ra rahaja if i've got her pronunciation right she's responding to this what wampum belt um ins installate the notion excuse me the notion of the wampum belt and what it signifies uh so you just if you see i don't know i don't need to read that right and then the next slide um jolene ricard also describes that wampum belt and i was thinking of beatrice's um talk yesterday and the notion of the two two runners to a sled and i wonder if there's any connection uh, between the notion of the two runners to the sled and the notion of the wampum belt and the the two rivers separated in the um sovereignty so that that's a question I've I've got for for y'all. Okay, um, good. I think next slide. So as we've heard a lot about the Dawes Act, I want I want to look at one, just one one piece of literature in response. And and it's well I'll say so in an in an earlier method of attempted tribal erasure through citizenship comes 35 years before the passage of the Citizenship Act, and it comes in the form of the Dawes Act. And again, we've heard so much about this in in the last couple of days. The, this 1887 Land Land General Allotment Act proposed to divide the land and the treaty rights in into parcels. And as some of you've heard. Um, of this this uh, scholar Philip Deloria has pointed out quote by articulating assimilation as official American Indian policy the government insisted that real Indians were now to exist within uh, American national boundaries they were to disappear as discrete social groups and exist only as individuals as, an, as the act dissolved commonly held Indian land, it promised American citizenship to those individuals um, who, and, and, and I ended the quote, sorry, uh, those individuals who accepted their allotted land and the act could confer citizenship to those who received it. Um, and I have, I, maybe the next slide. Another one? Yes. Yeah, next one. Okay, so this is the evidently the the pledge that people that were asked to take when they when they accepted citizenship in the context of allotment. You have shot your last arrow. That means you are no longer to live the life of an Indian. You are from this day forward to live the life of a white man the white man but you may keep that arrow as it will be to you a symbol of your noble race and the pride you feel that that you come um, from the first of all americans and so for the for the men it was a, an arrow for women it was a purse um, with the words this means that you that is you women have chosen the life of a white woman and the white woman loves her home um, as theodore roosevelt said no we're good still as theodore roosevelt said in 1901 in the context of the dawes act quote in my judgment the time has arrived when we should definitely make up our minds to recognize the indian as an individual and not as a member of a tribe the general allotment act is a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass 
end, end quote. Um, I think, I think the, yeah. Nope, not yet, not yet. Um, so this statement by, it comes from the, this statement comes from the, um, the, the uh, Rough Rider president who said in a, of the 1864 Sand Creek Massacre, and I'll quote Roosevelt again, um, I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with the Sand Creek, right? Okay, so he, Roosevelt said, the so-called Shivington or Sand Creek Massacre, in spite of certain most objectionable details, was on the whole as righteous and beneficial a deed as ever took place on the frontier. Um, yeah, okay. So the, the now we can do the next slide. So one little brief story I want to refer to, and this is strictly because I want to be in that club that Lionel referred to yesterday about those people who, who like or read um, Oskison. So writing about John Milton Oskison, born in, born in 1874, and his attitude toward the U.S. citizenship, Lionel Laure argues that, quote, when Oskison ad advocated for the U.S. citizenship, his purpose was not to civilize the Indians and certainly not to moralize them either. It was to provide them with the administrative and political rights that could put Indians on an equal footing with their European American neighbors. Okay, that's, that's Laure um, speaking. Uh, in a short story concerning the Allotment Act, Oskison has a character with a somewhat different uh, um, approach. If, uh, so Tuxte's Tuk, mistake um, is the, na the name of the story. No, they stay there, yeah. Um, so he fictionalizes that decision of a man who opts to leave Indian territory altogether rather than submit to allotment and the loss of his hunting grounds. So you, well, yeah. Tuxte's mistake, the story, tell. Okay, Tuxte's mistake tells the story of an Indian man who is confronted with the Land Severalty Act and decides that he'd rather live in Mexico than stay and submit to the expected influx of, influx of non-native people into Cherokee land and recently established Indian territory. As the story's narrator reports, Tuxte had a love of freedom from the prairies where he had grown up, he, quote, imbibed a love of freedom, the love that is not voiced by brazen lunged patriots, but the kind that the coyote pup sucks from its mother's breast and which prevents you from ever taming the little vagrant, end quote. Oskison recounts a town meeting in which the in which the tribal members meet with the commissioners sent from Washington. And this is, yeah, this is, no, this is the slide, okay? You would cut up our land into squares and make us stay on the little chunk we got in the cutting up. You, you made treaties with us. We have kept our part faithfully. You say you will not keep yours. Um, and then Tuxte decides to leave rather than stay on this land for fear of, of um, white uh, settlement and the, uh, the, st the st spoiler alert, the story ends with his dying um, en route to, to Mexico. He, he, he leaves from Mexico where he says things will be, he'll be free again, uh, but he doesn't make it. So what, what Oskison is up to in that death is preferable to um, allotment is, is uh, a, troubling, a troubling thesis, but that's one of the ways to read the, the story. Um, yeah, I think we can do the next slide. I was, I was going to talk about tracks, but I'm not going to. Um, but I do want to just point this out. I was thinking in, in the, one of the talks yesterday, Anne Gregory um, mentioned why do fam I think it was she who mentioned why do families self-consume in the face of allotment? Didn't, did that, is that where that came up? Okay. Um, and then I, I heard it again just now in Renee's paper, right? With the, the what's the name of the family again? That, that's cheating to get that? Okay, mm -hmm. so that's what I would have talked about with the tracks. But I want to I want to just go to um, a Thomas King story. So I think the next, yeah, a Thomas King story called Borders. Um, I just want to I kind of essentially conclude with with a, with that story. But before, if, for those of you who don't know Thomas King's novel Truth and Brightwater, 
uh, I, I recommend it. It's an absolutely delightful novel. It's Truth and Brightwater are two um, border towns, Canada and, and the U.S. And um, so the issues of the border and citizenship are, are full. I'm, not, I'm actually not talking about that um, novel, but I do want to mention after, um, after Maggie's talk this morning and that, and that painting she showed us where where the um, the Indians have been put back in the landscape. In Truth and Bright Water, King has a character who's employed as as one who restores old paintings. And he at first he restores old paintings, but then as a native man, he starts putting the Indians back in those in those landscapes. Uh, and that doesn't go over well with the curators at the at these museums. Um, so in, in Thomas King's Borders, then, I want now briefly to turn to this short, this, this short story written by Cherokee writer Thomas King, who was born a U.S. citizen in 1943 in the United States and who now lives in Canada. And speaking of citizenship, he has thus sometimes been referred to as an expatriate writer. In his 1993 short story, Borders, King describes how, Blackfoot wo how a Blackfoot woman wants to cross from Canada into the United States with her young son, who is the story's narrator. So you're getting it from the perspective of a, a maybe 12-year-old. Um, in order to visit her adult daughter who lives in Salt Lake City. Denied entry into the U.S. because she insists that she is Blackfoot rather than U.S. or Canadian, she is then refused entry back into Canada again because she asserts her Blackfoot identity. She and her son thus are caught between the, the three nations uh, and they have to spend three days uh, in this liminal space between the U.S. and Canada uh, before the news outlets pick up the story and because of some embarrassment essentially um, they, they are led into the United States. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the premise of the story and if we look at the next, the next slide I think so this, this, when they're trying to get into the United States, the, these are the questions that she's asked. Okay, and again, from this is how the the, tw the twelve year old son is narrating it because he he says a little after this he says I know what they were asking for. He understands what they want to hear, uh, and the mother refuses to to give him that. Okay, so King explains in the in the essay truth the truth about stories that the border doesn't mean that much to the majority of native people in either country it i'm quoting i'm quoting king here it is after all a figment of someone else's imagination end quote according to melanie anderson by encouraging readers to re-examine the 49th parallel in light of native transnationality king raises fundamental questions about the presumed dominance of nation states and what their contact zones both conceal and reveal. Another literary critic, Evelyn Mayer, uh, is interested in how the Blackfoot mother's predicament in the duty-free shop, she spends her days in between, right, the, the two borders, so she goes into the duty-free shop and, and the space between the two countries, quote, acquires new meaning as a place of refuge, hybridity, and a third space beyond the border binaries. And they actually, she develops a relationship, I mean, a, friend, a friendly relationship with the, with the um, the proprietor of the of the the duty free shop, who's first resistant, and then um, especially as a metaphor for social space in in this this duty free shop. According to Abdul uh, Ibrahim Abdul in his essay, quote, it is no longer possible to go back home. Through uh, the throughout the story, King differentiates between two kinds of borders, physical and metaphorical. The first one occurs between U.S. and Canada, and the second refers to a border between someone's identity and citizenship. And that's that's where my interest and our our interest um, here is is in this story. So. Um, if we look if we look at the next slide so she's refused entry into the US then she tries immediately to go back into Canada uh, and is asked the same question she she asserts her Blackfoot citizenship um, and so is caught is caught between and then as I said because the media picks it up they are allowed into the United States she goes down to Utah visits her daughter a week or so later she comes back to the border and what's interesting here is Thomas King does not pick up 
the story of the bor again, they pass freely through both borders in, in the story, which I find very curious. And if we look at the, the next slide then, and so this is the final paragraph of the, of the story. And what's fascinating to me as, a, as an English teacher who, who once in a while talks grammar to his students, we see what, what happens here. It was almost evening when we left the border town of Coots. I watched the border through the rear, this, remember this is a 12 year old, okay? I watched the border through the rear window until all you could see were the tops of the flagpoles and the blue water tower. And then they rolled over a hill and disappeared. Okay, so I see some people kind of, right? What, grammatically, what is going on here? Right, so who's, do, who's doing the rolling? And I, I don't know whether or not to read too much, in, if I'm reading too much into this, but I think in a way, partly it's the 12-year-old's confusion, right? And so you wouldn't, because it's clear to, on the one hand, it's the people in the car who are rolling over the hill. But on the other hand, there's this grammatical confusion as a final sentence in a story in which the whole issue of crossing the border and Blackfoot identity versus US or Canadian identity is completely dropped. And it's seen in a, in, yeah, and so that's in a sense how I, I'm reading this story is what, what can we do? It's, a gr gr it's grammatically, constitutionally, ethically problematic. And, and here, we, here we sit, right? Um, so that, that's how I'm reading the story. And then just as one final, um, final, final slide. The, the bookstore up the street here, several of you have discovered. I walked in there to set between on the lunch break and there were like 15 of us in there. Um, there's actually a Wandering Stars is for sale. An English version of Wandering for Stars is Wandering Stars is in that, is in that bookstore. Okay. <laughs> Um, but I, I just wanted to conclude with this, and especially the part in bold. Um, it, the, the, the novel, for, for those of you, I don't wanna, I'm not going to give very much at all away, but it's in two major parts. Um, there's an early part and then, a, and then a, a later part, chronologically two parts, okay? At the end of the first part, in, in essence, so in the year 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act, will have been granted even though they will mean to dissolve tribes by giving citizenship, dissolve being another world for, for a, excuse me, dissolve being another word for disappearance, a kind of chemical word for gradual death of tribes of Indians, a clinical killing designed by psychopaths calling themselves politicians. What I want to emphasize though, it's not the part in bold, is, but, but what follows. Because in a sense, what, he, what he turns to then, and the second half of the book shows us this, uh, is survival or survivance or however we want to term it, okay? So if we can take a tiny bit of, of positive um, from, from this, I, I, I want, you know, right, it's a kind of victory. There is a kind of victory. Um, so yeah, thank you.